Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be starting a new series of videos discussing my favorite book series of all time. Best book series I've ever come across. And that is The Tarot Sequence by Katie Edwards. Now this video is going to focus more on the first book, The Last Sun. There are also two other books called The Lord Hangman and The Hourglass Throne, which I will touch on in later videos. So this first video is just mainly doing a bunch of world building and talking about the first book. I have my paperback editions right here, which I will be referencing. I also have the hardcover editions with the signed nameplates that I'm very proud of. And then I also have the ebook versions as well. So as you can tell, I absolutely love this series. And I've read each of the books at least five or six times. And I've actually gone back and read the first book so I can get caught up in everything, make sure there was nothing that I was missed, and so that I could go over this thoroughly with you. Now, in this series of books, like I said, it's an urban sci-fi action fantasy type novel. Uh, it's basically a what if story. You know, what if Atlantis was real and Atlantis had managed to make it into the modern world? You know, what would this world look like? What would Atlantis and the society of Atlanteans look like? What kind of events would they have to go through? Now, before I dive into the first book and start talking about the characters and what happens, I think it'd be better to start with some world building to describe, to let you know what Atlantis is like, what the world is like, what some of the history is. Now, this world that Katie Edwards has created is extremely detailed. You know, a lot of authors, when they create a book, they will create the character, they create a premise, they build the world around that. In this book, Katie Edwards did something different. He created the world first, created all the different events, decided how many books he wanted to have, then he created the characters. And he asked himself, what, how would these characters respond in this world? How would they respond to these events? So this series of book actually follows Rune St. John. Uh, off to my left, he's the guy with the glowing eyes. He is the last heir and scion of the Sun Throne. And these books are basically his accounts of what happened or what's happening. So before I dive into him, let's go back and do a little bit of world building. So in this world, the history is pretty much the same as ours. You know, you have the rise of, you know, the Romans, the Greeks, you know, you have Egypt and the pyramids, you know, you have all the wars like the Revolutionary War, World War One, World War Two. All of the history and everything follows the same as ours. That is up as up until the late 1940s when the space race started happening. That's when our world and this fictional world basically diverged, took two different paths. So in this world, you have Atlantis. Atlantis is a continent that exists in the Atlantic Ocean. It's larger than the state of California, but smaller than Japan. Uh, you have all kinds of supernatural creatures in this world. You know, you have drogs, you have the undead, you have banshees, you have sprites, you have werebeasts. You have harpies, you have dragons, basically whatever you can think of exists in this world. Um, they don't exclusively live on the continent of Atlantis. You know, they exist all around the world, but Atlantis is a very mystical, you know, supernatural type place. And the most important race that lives on Atlantis is, of course, the Atlanteans. Uh, the Atlanteans are a unique group of humans, a unique race. You know, they're virtually the same as humans. They can even breed with humans. The only difference is, is they have magic. You know, they use primarily sigil magic. So there are other types of forms of magic too, but sigils is their primary source of using magic. Um, a sigil is basically a device or an object that they can store magic in. It can be something like a cane, an umbrella, piece of clothing, jewelry, like a necklace, ring, watch, pretty much anything. It's pretty much limitless on what a sigil can be. Um, and all an Atlantean has to do is basically focus a certain magic into that sigil. Uh, and then at a later point in time, they can basically release that magic whenever they want. And there are different types of sigils. You know, you have your basic sigils, you have your mass sigils which are more powerful, 
But the main idea is basically they can perform magic and they do this through sigils. Now there are, they can use what are called cantrips, which are, which are basically small magic that they can perform, like creating a ball of glowing light that doesn't require sigil. Um, but the main, main form is sigil magic. Now there is another weird aspect it is actually called an aspect <laughs> that, that the Atlanteans have. So basically those who are quite powerful in magic actually have what's called an aspect. It's a physical manifestation, almost like a subconscious uh, magical being within them that they can project out into the world. Um, Lord Sun, for instance, you know, appears as a column of light. Lady Justice appears as a spider. You know, you have other rumors of people having aspects where they appear as a tornado, you know, or a burning bush. You know, aspects are basically a way to let others know, hey, you've pissed me off and, you know, if you don't stop, you're going to regret it. I'm more powerful than you. So there's all kinds of different magic, but the main source is sigil. Now, another thing that makes them unique from humans is that they can use what's called rejuvenation magic which is actually controlled more by the Papist throne. Um, so they can basically rejuvenate and go back to a younger self. So kind of in a way, Atlanteans are semi-immortal. You know, when they get old, they rejuvenate, they go back. Um, so that's based on the main difference between Atlanteans and humans. They have magic, they can rejuvenate, they're kind of semi-immortal. So on Atlantis, you know, the political structure of Atlantis, we actually don't quite know much about what Atlantis was like, um, which I'll get to later in the video. But basically, it's set up on a class structure where you have arcana houses at the top, you have greater houses, lesser houses. Um, and it's kind of based on the tarot cards, but in the book, the Atlanteans, the tarot sequence is actually based off Atlanteans. I know it sounds a bit complicated, but you know, the author, he based it off the tarot sequence, but in the book, it's the exact opposite. The tarot sequence is actually based off the Atlanteans and basically their political structure and power system of their society. Um, so basically at the bottom, you have the lesser houses. In the middle, you have the greater houses. And then at the top, you have the arcana houses. And basically the power and wealth goes from, you know, the top down. So lesser houses are poor, less powerful, greater houses are more powerful, more wealthier than lesser houses. Then you have the Arcana houses. They are the most powerful, most influential, wealthiest in Atlantean society and of course the world. Now at the head of each Arcana house is what's called an Arcana. They are the most powerful beings on the planet. They are basically gods on this world. And there are 22 of them that exist in the world. Um, so basically everything Atlantis is set up to basically serve the Arcana and all the other lesser houses serve the Arcana and their families. Um, and it's actually quite a ruthless society, you know, which is something I actually kind of love about this book. Um, it's a very dog eat dog, dog eat dog type of world, you know, where basically if you're an Arcana, you can do whatever you want. And if you're lesser than an arcana or lesser than that house, uh, you, you can't do crap, you know? So it's actually a really, I, I just really like that power structure. I don't know why. And I think it's because the main character goes in and really screws it up for all the people at the top. I think that's why I really like it. But that's basically Atlantis. You know, it's a very power structure type of society, you know, where the arcana, arcana are at the top. You know, another thing about their society is they don't coddle their victims, which is something the main character, Rune, talks about quite often. You know, if you get hurt or you fail, they're not going to coddle you. They're not, they're not going to do anything like that. Instead, they're going to use you as a lesson. And he says that they actually use people as moral lessons on fitness and survival. Um, so it's a very ruthless society. Now... The people of Atlantis and Atlanteans have remained hidden for a very long time. Hundreds, thousands of years they've remained hidden from the human world. And so much of our history follows the same as this world. That is, is up until the 1940s, I think it said 1946, when the space race happened. 
that's when things started to unravel for the Atlanteans. You know, their magic that concealed them and hid their island and hid their way of life could no longer stand up to the technology that the humans were creating. And unfortunately, with the invention of satellites and astronauts going into space, their island and way of life was discovered. Now, rather than trying to, you know, hide off or do some kinds of magics to hide them from the world, they decided to put on their best clothes, come out to the world, basically coming out of the closet, kind of, and announcing their presence. Of course, this did not be, this was not received very well by the human race. It ended up resulting in the Atlantean World War, which was very devastating for both sides. Eventually, after a few years at war, uh, the Atlantean World War came to an end, and a truce was reached between the humans and the Atlanteans. Now, during the war, there was mass devastations. You know, part of Poland became uninhabitable. Parts of uh, Seattle and Washington on the Pacific Northwest became uninhabitable. And unfortunately, it, the continent of Atlantis also became uninhabitable. So as part of the truce between the humans and the Atlanteans, uh, the Atlanteans were given the island of Nantucket off the coast of Massachusetts so that they may resettle and rebuild their society. Um, this officially became known as the unsettlement. Um, this took about three decades for them to basically evacuate Atlantis and move to the island of Nantucket. Uh, during those three decades, they started performing translocation magic, transporting buildings from all across the world, from countries all across the world. Uh, they translocated sanctums, madhouses, churches, palaces, hotels, and skyscrapers basically rebuilding their society just in a handful of years. Now, unfortunately, all of this translocation magic, while quite impressive, was actually had some very negative side effects. Now, all of these buildings and everything were mostly translocated to the east side of the island, where they had built their metropolis uh, area where they all live. The western half of the island, unfortunately, was affected by the magic. Uh, it basically became a poisoned, magical back, backwash of land uh, where deadly messes of monsters and pocket, pocket dimensions and wild magic exist. Uh, the only ones that actually go into the Westland are the Arcana, uh, where they actually spend their extreme wealth and magic to build comp heavily warded compounds in the Westlands. They basically go there for retreats, you know, which is crazy because most people would not want to go to such a dangerous area, but that's who the arcana are they use their power and flaunt it around by going and you know vacation in the westlands so you have this settled new settlement of new atlantis this new city that's been born uh atlantis actually carried over a lot of its old traditions from atlantis uh, but there are some new things about new atlantis that i'm actually not quite sure about like in new atlantis you have the convocation which is an elected body of officials. They're a lot like uh, the legislative branch here in the United States. You know, there are elected officials, they create the laws, they help govern the country, govern New Atlantis. Um, but unfortunately, Atlanta, New Atlantis is not a uh, democracy. So basically this convocation is basically just the face of Atlantis for the human world. The real powerhouse is the arcanum it and the arcana uh, it has always has been and always will you know it even talks about in the book that you know the arcana and the arcanum they are not the kings on the hill they are the hill itself so whatever happens in atlantis you know it's all has to do with the arcanum now the arcanum is made up of course the arcana there's 22 of them you have certain power blocks within the arcanum uh, certain alliances between the different arcana like you have the moral certainty moral certainties which are you know lady justice lady temperance lord strength and lord hermit you have the celestials which are lady moon lord star and lord sun um, they basically rule over atlantis now after new atlantis was formed you know some of the arcana fit in very well with this new world others didn't Lord Tower and Lord Sun, they fit in very well with this new world. They became very prominent. They became the faces of New Atlantis. So in the 1980s, 
you know, things are going great. The economy's booming for New Atlantis. The economy's booming for the human world. Uh, the alliances that they've formed with each other, they're great. Now, Lord Sun, he actually ends up having one child, a boy. Um, that is Rune St. John. Um, and of course, this is the 80s, you know, and there's an ancient tradition amongst Atlanteans where they would magically bind a child to their children to basically grow up and become bodyguards to help keep their child safe. And they are known as the Companions of Atlantis. So in the 80s, uh, Lord Sun goes out and purchases a child, purchases Brandon, uh, this guy Brandon, who is actually the guy holding the gun on the cover of the book, um, and he binds his son, Rune, and Brand together. Um, and they become companions. Now, it's not a telepathic bond. So it's not like they can read each other's thoughts or anything like that. It's more of they can sense each other's feelings. So they can sense when someone's in danger. They can sense when some, someone's happy or mad. You know, basically, it's a way of helping. They can even kind of sense, from what I can tell, their location. So if you don't know exactly where they're at, you know, okay, they're off that way. I know they're that way, or they're back behind me. You know, it's a way of binding together in order to keep them safe. So they're usually bound as children, you know, and they grow up together. Then they're eventually, you know, trained on different stuff. You know, Rune eventually goes to school, starts learning about sigil magic and how to use that. Bran goes off the, uh, what is it, companion? <laughs> type school where he learns about all about guns, knives, bombs, strategy, how to kill people, how to protect people. Um, so they have a very, Rune and Brand have a very normal scion type of childhood, especially, you know, since their father is an arcana, you know, Lord Sun, very wealthy, very powerful. I would say probably one of the wealthiest and mo most powerful arcana in New Atlantis. Now, of course, they get older. They're about in their teenage years. And they do what all teenagers do. They like to sneak out, especially Rune. He likes to sneak out and go party with all the other, you know, scions of Atlantis. So one night, you know, he's about 15 years old. He sneaks out, goes doing some partying. Bran, of course, you know, chases after him to go make sure to keep him safe. As they're making their way back to the Sun Court, the Sun Estate, basically, they end up finding themselves in the middle of an unsanctioned raid. Now, basically, I will get into a little bit more about raids later, but basically it's where, you know, you go in and basically destroy a house and take all, all their belongings, kill everyone there, take their belongings, you know. Um, it's a very, very bad event. And this is a, an unsanctioned one. It means it's not part of the the arcana didn't sanction this raid they didn't say hey go in and destroy this court this was a bunch of unknown assailants have gone in and decided to take down the sun court for whatever reason and of course rune and bran walk in right in the middle of this unsanctioned raid now lord sun is unfortunately killed so are all the live-in staff at the estate you know all the butlers the maids the cooks everyone is slaughtered the only two people who survived this unsanctioned raid are Rune and Brand. And Rune unfortunately suffers a very, very bad assault at the hands of nine masked men. Um, he is basically raped for hours on end. You know, it's a very traumatic event. Brand unfortunately manages to get free from his captors. He goes and saves Rune. They make it off the estate, make it to the hospital where Rune's life can be saved. Um, afterwards, they end up going to Lord Tower, who is actually best friends with Lord Sun, um, and they actually seek refuge with Lord Tower. And Lord Tower basically tells them, look, I will support you. I will you know, make sure you're ha housed, make sure you're clothed, you're fed. I will even make sure you get the schooling that you need. But in a couple of years, when you become an adult, you're out. You know, you got to hit the road. You know, and like I said before, you know, it's a very ruthless society you know he's rune has lost everything he's lost his father his family you know all his belongings he was you know brutally assaulted you know while tower does offer him some relative safety it's not going to last forever he has to find his own footing you know which doesn't make a whole lot of sense at first but as you read the books 
it begins to make more sense why the tower did that. So basically Lord Tower basically teaches him how to fight. They both end up becoming mercenaries and they do odd jobs for the tower and anyone else who's willing to pay them. They're basically, you know, if they need some kind of information, private investigative type work, following people, blackmailing people, you know, it maybe even killing some people. It's all well and good if they're getting paid. So they're basically hired mercenaries. Eventually, at some point when they're in their 20s, they leave the service of the tower um, and then they end up going and finding their own place. They've been buying this halfway house, not a halfway house, but they call it half house. So basically a developer created a little subdivision. He did not divide up the plot of lands properly. So when he got done, he had one really small portion of land. And instead of just, you know, selling it to the houses nearby, he decided to build this really small, like 10 foot wide house that's four stories tall. So it's like this little bitty half house. And that's what they call it. And that's where they live. And they do odd jobs here and there. And they're very poor. And they just barely scrape by paycheck to paycheck. So many years go by. And this is actually where the first book begins to take place. The main characters are about their mid 30s, about 35, 36 years old. And this is, you know, taking like 2016, 2017, I think, is when this book actually takes place. You know, and so this is where The Last Son actually picks up. All right. So before I dive into the first book, I do want to read the prologue from the second book. It actually sums up a lot of everything that I've already talked about. It does it a lot more neatly than what I've done. So I don't know why it's in the second book. I really feel it should be in the first. But uh, I do want to read it to you because it'll make a lot more sense. So it says, For my kind, the first sign our world was ending came on October 24th, 1946. Over the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, a V-2 rocket shot 65 miles in the space to take the first ever grainy black and white photo of the curvature of the Earth. As humans celebrated their milestone, my people brooded over what it meant. We watched with mounting unease as satellites and rockets were invented and launched, greedily capturing, capturing images of the planet's continents and waters. The turning point, the final failure of our magics and illusions, came when Yuri Gagarin, a Russian cosmonaut, circled the Earth in Vostok 1 from that unimaginable distance, his human, human eyes succeeded in doing what so many others had not. They pierced our veils. They had reputed, reputedly, there's reputedly a sound recording of Gagarin accused of being drunk when he told someone to run and grab a damned atlas. What he saw was an enormous North Atlantic island, more or less on the same latitude as Massachusetts and Maine, about the size of Japan, maybe a little smaller than the state of California, Atlantis. So the gig was up and Atlanteans knew it. My people decided to put on their finest, drop the spells that had kept the homeland hidden for millennia and revealed themselves to the world. Have you seen the newscasts, read about the riots, watched footage of the crowded churches and highways? The existence of Atlantis changed humanity's perspective of everything. We've been the root of so many myth and legend. Forget Zeus and Odin and Shiva. We were the tricksters, the thunder gods, the fertility de deities and battle crows, the sorcerers and shape, shape, shape shifters. We are the fae, the vampires, the wares, the undead. Humans have even pinched the names of our leaders and repackaged them into the mystical equivalent of playing cards, the tarot deck. There really was a hierophant and a fool a devil and the will of fortune, temperance and justice. They are collectively called Arcana, 22 ancient men and women, each with the firepower of nations. Humanity beheld, a freakish, freakishness in all our, humanity beheld our freakishness in all its glory and decided the most sensible course of action was to destroy us. The Atlantean World War was brief. The cost was high. Magically radioactive wastes in the Pacific Northwest and half of Poland, the near extinction of dragon kind, a viral plague that decimated the Atlantean homeland, a hundred thousand headstones, trillions of dollars in damage. At the end, both parties sat down and signed a peace accord. Flash forward to the late 1960s. 
By then, the last of Atlantean race had gathered as refugees on an island off the Massachusetts coast, where they had been steadily and secretly buying land since the 1940s. The settling of Nantucket, privately called the Unsettlement, would last three decades. Its display of magic unprecedented before and since, the Arcana came together to translocate abandoned human ruins from different parts of the human world. Virtually overnight, they created a patchwork of Gotham of brilliant, dense, and staggering architecture. This vertical sprawl has become known as the city of New Atlantis. Now, in the modern era, New Atlantis has settled its bones. It has become a world-class city with a world-class economy, powered by the talent and savvy of long-lived beings. My name is Rune St. John. I am before anything else a survivor of a fallen house, of a brutal assault, of violent allies and complacent enemies, of life among a people who turned their back on me decades ago. Among those who matter, I am known and notorious. I am the Catamite Prince, the Day Prince, the Ruined Prince. I am the last sign of my dead father's dead court, once called the Sun Throne, brightest of all arcana. Now just so much ash and rubble. These are my accounts. All right, so this book picks up with Rune St. John, and they are actually in the middle of a raid. So basically in New Atlantis, you have all the arcana, you have all their houses. When a house does something they're not supposed to, when they've caused a lot of trouble, uh, the Arcanum can actually come together and form what's called a sanction raid, where they can actually go in and basically destroy that house. They either kill or imprison all of its inhabitants. They seize the property. They seize the bank accounts. They seize the sigils. You know, they take everything and then they divide it amongst themselves. It can be a very profitable adventure, but it also weakens Atlantis as a whole when they do this. So they only do it in the most extreme of circumstances. Now we talked about the raid on Lord on the Sun Court, which was not sanctioned at all by the Arcanum. But at the beginning of the book, this book, you actually have Rune and Brand. They're actually part of this sanctioned raid against the the Heart Throne, which is actually the Lover's Throne, basically. So the book starts out. Brand is outside, keep an eye on everything. You know, you have a bunch of people outside getting ready for this raid. Rune and a couple of others have been tasked with infiltrating a party that's going on at the lover's estate. Um, so basically he uses magic to disguise himself, uh, and so does everyone else, and they're basically inside at this party just waiting for this raid to begin. So and you have Rune walking around. Rune is a bit bitter, you know. Ex you know, he looks at all these arcana, looks at all these people throwing these lavish parties and throwing money around and that should be him, but it's not because his court has fallen, you know, and so he is a bit bitter on it. It's very understandable. And I, you know, understand where he, he's going in his little talks about how, you know, people have just lost their way. And he talks about how the lovers themselves have really lost their way. You know, the lover's throne used to be, I guess, a very friendly, very open and loving court. Um, but after the Atlantean World War, that changed. And it turns out the Lover's Throne was actually meant to be ruled by two people, by lovers, a pair of lovers. Um, during the Atlantean World War, Lady Lover's husband, he was killed. So now she's set to basically rule the throne by herself. And this basically twisted her mind and she started getting in some very bad stuff. So at the beginning of this book, Rune's talking about the Heart Throne, and how far they have fallen and why this raid is taking place. One thing he mentions is, you know, in Atlantis, it's a very dog eat dog type world. You can basically do whatever you want. You know, the more powerful you are, you can do whatever you want. Now the Arcana or the lovers Arcana house was basically doing things they shouldn't be. They were basically drugging and raping people. Um, there is some evidence to suggest children were involved in this. And while this is very bad, um, for, to a certain extent, they were allowed to do it because they are an arcana house. You do, they are gods on earth. They can do what they want. But there, there's more to it. That's one of the pieces of puzzle on why this raid was formed. 
And later on, you end up finding out there's something called Pro Project Laces or Laesis. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. We don't really find out a whole lot about what this project is. I think it was some type of GIOS or mind control type project. Um, but this project is why the Arcanum has come together. This is why they are forming this raid. Um, this is where it starts off. So Rune's waiting for the raid to begin. The raid happens. You know, he's talking about, you know, the well, talking about the fall of his court, talking about raids. Um, eventually the raid happens. And his whole job there is he's been employed by the tower to basically go in, get access to the lover's database. You know, the tower wants this project like Lysis or Lasis. He wants that data, wants that information. So after the raid starts, Rune goes, gets the information. He's making his way out of the building. And as he's trying to get out, he ends up coming across Elena herself. She is the Arcana of the Heart Throne, Lady Lovers. He ends up following her um, into some kind of like pocket dimension. Um, basically they have a little talk he gets to see her aspect which her aspect is actually that of a hornet that has a very strong scent of honey and semen which apparently she causes arousal in people that are around her which is very fitting since she is lady lovers she is the arcana of the heart throne so basically they have their little talk with each other and lady lovers wants rune to do her a favor she wants him to basically see a package to its destination and in return she will let him go free and she will give him a sigil now rune because his court had fallen he lost all of his sigils all of his family sigils were lost over the course of the years he's managed to gather a few of them um, most arcana you know have hundreds maybe even thousands of sigils you know in arcana families they have a whole room where there's a stockpile of sigils for them to use. Rune doesn't have that. He has like six, I think at this point, and that's it. That is a very, very low amount. So when Lady Lovers offers to give him a sigil, he can't help himself, he, he takes it. So he agrees to take this package of whatever that she wants. And she says this package will be delivered to his house. All he has to do is keep it safe until it arrives at his destination. He takes the sigil, he leaves and of course there's a bunch of fighting some massive explosion at the end there's a dragon i mean katie edwards really set up this first chapter really just out the door running and it's actually really awesome now after the raid on the lover's court they bran and rune return to half house and there where they live you know half house is just this little four-story house you have bran who lives in the basement you have the living room and kitchen on the first floor. The second floor is a guest bedroom and a bathroom. The third floor is a sanctum where every arcana or every Atlantean house has a sanctum. It's a place where the Atlanteans can go to restore their sigil magic. It makes it a lot easier to store magic in their sigils. Then you have Brand or not Brand Rune who lives on the fourth floor. Now they do have a housekeeper named Queenie which I'm gonna talk about her more later on. She lives in a shed out back. Um, and usually when they come, when Bran and Rune come home from a mission, Queenie always cooks some cookies. Usually chocolate chip or oatmeal raisin from what I can under understand, which Rune likes the chocolate chip, Bran I guess likes the oatmeal raisin, but whatever. Um, so they, when they get home from the missions, they always have cookies available. So they get home from the raid, they walk in, no cookies have been made and rune and brand are basically about to have a fit <laughs> you know they're not getting their cookies they're like what the hell is going on well queenie comes in and says rune why have you purchased a 16 year old boy <laughs> or why have you agreed to take a sigil from this at, at you know in in return for a 16 year old boy I, I forget exactly how she says it but and of course that throws rune off rune and brand are like what the hell is going on Turns out Lady Lovers has tricked her, or tricked him, basically. Uh, basically, this child, this teenager, is Matthias St. Valentine. He is the grandson of Lady Lovers. And for some reason, 
he is special to her and he she wanted to keep him safe so i have a feeling she knew this raid was coming she somehow got some knowledge ahead that this was going to happen so she sent her grandson to uh rune's place to live with him and basically the package of destination is his adulthood and at this point i think matthias is like 16 17 years old and in, in atlantean society the age of adulthood is 21. so he's going to be stuck with them for a couple of years you know so of course the chapter ends rune goes to bed the next day rune wakes up to a bunch of commotion downstairs now the first time i read this book this scene really bothered me you know but later on as i've reread it and i've read the books i understand why it happened this way and i've watched a few other people review this book and this scene really bothers people so when rune wakes up he hears a bunch of commotion downstairs he goes downstairs and he finds bran shoving this teenager's head in the toilet so about this <laughs> which his name is he goes by max later in the book so i'm going to keep calling him max because that's how i know him but uh brand is basically shoving max's head in the toilet basically assaulting him you know this is straight up child abuse you know and so rune asks you know what the hell's going on brand says to him you know he apparently max got a little mouthy with their housekeeper queenie um and so brand is just teaching him a lesson and of course you know max looks at rune thinking oh he's gonna save him rune doesn't do that he takes him throws him in the shower turns on the cold water basically tells him he needs to straighten up uh he's only here um because they're willing to let him be there basically um you know otherwise he'd be out on the street and possibly imprisoned or killed right now you know that scene you know it really bothers me that whole child abuse and the how they acted towards max but it, it makes sense. Max has lost everything. He's lost his family. He's lost his wealth, lost any sigils the family may have, his any standing in society. There are people who want him, the lover's family, dead. Anyone. Doesn't matter if they were involved in whatever this Project Laces was. He is in danger. You know, and he needs to wake up and understand that immediately. Um, so that's why they responded in this way. I don't think it's the best way of getting that message across uh, but still it is what it is it's a very ruthless society brand and rune know this firsthand you know and basically the tower did same thing to them you know there was an event where you know uh, lord tower ended up having brand whipped as a teenager and it left a very bad stain on both rune and brand but uh anyway i'm getting a little off topic with that but so yeah you have that little scene with uh max and brandon rune and i don't know i feel better about it now than when i first came across it so if it bothers you just keep reading it'll make more sense later so after this event at half house rune is summoned to go meet with the tower uh the tower is the head of the dagger throne he is basically the spy i guess of atlantis um that's how the tower was originally set up that whole court system they were basically the spies, the interrogators, the assassins, um, which makes sense on why Brun and Ran, Bran and Rune became mercenaries, basically. So Rune goes, meets the tower. He takes Max with him. You know, that way he can learn a little bit about Max. And there's a strange scene on the sidewalk that I want to talk about later, but I won't get into it too much right now. Um, so Rune goes and meets the tower tower tells him that you know look i have a new mission for you you know you did a great job at lady lover's raid you know i got a new new mission for you now this man by the name of adam saint nicholas he is the middle son uh to lady justice he is a sign of a scion of atlantis and has gone missing and to make things even more interesting adam's older brother christian saint nicholas has gone into the hospital and this is all very very strange now lady lady justice doesn't seem to be too concerned about it but lord tower is he believes there's something going on and he only trusts rune and brand to look into it so the tower gives uh rune a folder with some information basically tells him get to work um after that rune sets off 
to investigate Adam's business partners. Uh, Adam St. Nicholas, he turns out he'd gone into business with a couple of other scions of Atlantis and they basically do charity type events like music festivals and stuff like that. Like a nonprofit, but it is a profit type of organization. I'm not exactly sure on the business structure, but basically they're doing some kind of charity work. Now, Adam has basically teamed up with three other guys. Uh, you have Jeffrey St. Talbot, who is the second child of Lady Temperance. And you have Michael St. Talbot, who is the youngest brother uh, of Lady Temperance, or youngest brother of Jeffrey. You know, so he's like the old, youngest son of Lady Temperance. Um, then you also have Ashton St. Gabriel, who is the son of Lord Strength, the Iron Hall. So together they've gone in the business and they've created this business in an area of the city called Leprechaun, which is a play on words because apparently the buildings in that area were translocated from a very poverty heavy Irish area in the United States. And so it was translocated to the island, they call it Leprechaun. Um, so Rune goes there to his business, to, to Adam's business to go to interrogate his business partners basically. Um, afterwards he is attacked um, and it's quite unknown why he was attacked. You know, the authorities basically believe it was wild magic. Now in Atlantis, you do have a military or police force in Atlantis and they're called the Garda. Um, and basically if you are an Arcana or part of an Arcana family, the Garda answered you. <laughs> so the Argata, the, the Lagarda show up basically to figure out, try to figure out what happened, why Rune was attacked, you know, and they basically sum it up to wild magic. Rune doesn't think otherwise. You know, this attack was obviously meditated, pre, you know, someone had to have done it. This is not just a case of just wild magic. Now, I don't want to go too much in the detail exactly what happens. You can read the book to find out what the attack was, but uh, basically he's almost killed. He manages to survive though. And so he starts to realize, you know, this whole Adam business, something's going on. Because, you know, at first he was thinking, you know, maybe Adam just ran off. You know, maybe he found a lover, you know, a girlfriend, boyfriend, something. He's run off with them, you know, and he's on some little holiday and just hasn't answered anyone. Lord Tower doesn't seem to think so. He thinks there's something going on. Adam's life is in danger. And after this attack, Rune is starting to think, yes, he, he is in fact in danger. You know, he needs to figure out what is going on. So after the attack at Adam's business in Leprechaun, they end up going to the Enclave to meet Lady Justice, where you get to see her aspect as a spider. That, you know, her aspect is that of an arachnid, um, which is very interesting. I love this whole scene at the Enclave. You know, and I love how they talk to each other because the, the Arcana, they are like gods. So when you're standing before one, you better be careful what you say. But Rune, at the same time, he is the son of an Arcana. He is the heir to the throne. In a way, he is a little Arcana. <laughs> you know, he's a one day going to be an Arcana. So there is some kind of respect between the existing Arcana and Rune. And I love seeing how that plays out and how they talk to her. You know, at one point, she even calls him little brother, which is some, in some ways showing respect to him. Now, after, you know, and basically, you know, Lady Justice, she's not concerned with Adam. You know, she's like, I have my own magics, you know. I can tell you if he's in danger. He's not. Don't worry about him. My children are strong enough to fend for themselves. And she basically says, you know, look, she will not step in to save one of her children. If their life is in danger, it's on them to get themselves out of it. Now, if they end up dying, you know, she will retaliate, you know. I forget exactly what the phrase she says is, but she's like, you know, she may, she's not sparing in her mercy, you know, or something like that. And it just goes to show you again, how ruthless Atlantis society really is. You know, you need to be able to stand on your own two feet and you need to survive. You cannot rely on other people to come help save you. So I love this whole little section with Lady Justice. It really gets a you get to see how the arcana is and how the power structure is and what life is really like. So after the Enclave, they end up proceeding to New Saints Hospital, Rune and Bran. They want to go and meet with Christian. 
Christian St. Nicholas is the older brother of Adam St. Nicholas. And he's in the hospital, which of course Rune and Bran both think there's something suspicious about that. Turns out Christian St. Nicholas is in a coma. Uh, he's, they don't exactly know why he's in a coma. It turns out he was poisoned, but basically at this time he's in a coma. They can't do nothing. While they're there, they run into Ashton St. Gabriel. Well, before they even run into Ashton, uh, Rune actually runs into Quinn. Quinn is one of my favorite characters out of this whole series, and I absolutely love him. He is the youngest child of Lady Justice, and he's a 15-year-old boy. I think he's 14, 15 at this point, um, and he has a very unique and rare ability. He is a seer of profit. Uh, seer of possibilities so whereas a normal seer can only see one future he can see all possible futures he can let you know what decision you should make and what decision if you make it what the outcome will be and he can actually use this ability to help sway events in a certain direction and he does it quite often i think quite more than what people seem to realize you know, there's a certain future he's aiming for, a certain future that he wants, and he's going to try to manipulate people down that certain path. And it's not malicious or anything like that. It's just a future where everyone can be happy. Quinn is a very sweet and kind, kind boy, and I absolutely love him. You know, and he's he's very funny, too. Like, there was one, anytime he talks, he always talks in these weird riddles that I absolutely love. There's one where he says, you know... Uh, where he says, you'll hit the bully with the bar stool after he calls me a freak, or at least you do most of the time. Sometimes Adam grabs the stool first. Once I was very brave and kicked him in the shin myself. So, you know, and at first Rune thinks he's a halfwit. He's like, what, what is wrong with this kid? Why is he talking like this? But then he, as they talk more, he ends up realizing he's seeing multiple futures, you know, and that's apparently a very rare and unique gift in Atlantis and for some reason Lady Justice doesn't like that like I don't know what it is with Atlantis but they don't like seers and even though this is a rare gift they I don't know I would think Lady Justice would really like this ability in the court like she could use it but she doesn't instead she treats Quinn like a pariah basically and Quinn even talks about it you know how ruthless Atlantean society is. Quinn was born premature. He was very weak, very sickly as a child. And because of this, Lady Justice basically casted him off to the side. And it became Adam's job basically to raise him. Um, and, that, and that's what Adam did. I think Adam was like a teenager, you know, 15, 16, maybe like 18 or something like that when Quinn was born. So here at a very young age, he's already raising a child on his own. Um, so they have a very, even though they're brothers, they are a father-son type of relationship. You know, and Quinn realizes that, you know, without Adam, he would have died. He would have died a long time ago. His family really doesn't care for him too much. You know, they don't like weakness, and that's all they see in him. He's a very sickly child. He was very weak, premature. And he has his seer abilities, which just makes things even worse, you know. So it's very important to Quinn that Adam gets safe. And so he wants to help Rune. And that's why he's come to the hospital. Um, and I love that whole interaction with him and Rune and Quinn discovering each other. It's fantastic. Well, eventually Ashton St. Gabriel shows up. You know, and of course, Bran and Ashton come stomping in. They run into Rune and Quinn, and they're immediately attacked. Um, so you go into this whole nother fight scene, fight for survival. And they end up discovering who keeps attacking them. And it's a summoned creature that called Rook. Basically, it's a zombie. So they don't actually use the term zombie in these books. They're actually called recarnates. Um, and so basically, he, this guy, Rook, was a very powerful spellcaster in life. And someone has basically summoned him and brought him back to life as a recarnate uh, to basically kidnap and attack Adam. You know, basically kidnap him and keep him safe. Um, then, of course, Rune steps in, starts looking for Adam. So Rook turns his attention to, to 
ca uh, room. So they're attacked, you know, awesome fight scene, you know, of course. They manage to make it out, and then they proceed on to Cubic Dreams. Um, Cubic Dreams is owned by the principality, Kieran. Now, when I first read this book, I pronounced his name Siren, and in fact, the author, Katie Edwards, actually says it in his head as Siren. But I looked up on Google how it's pronounced, and it's pronounced Kieran, and because I pronounced it that way for so long, that's the pronunciation I'm going to stay with. But uh, basically, Kieran is a principality. A principality is an arcana without a throne. Um, so they basically have all the same powers and little tricks and everything is an arcana. They just don't have an official throne or court. Now, they do still hold court to some extent, but they don't have a place on the arcanum. Um, so whereas all the other arcana, you know, when there's something decision that needs to be made they go to the arcanum they come together they take a little vote and they decide what to do principalities generally are not part of that whole process they don't have an actual active spot on the arcanum or active decision you know now they can go and basically talk with the arcana and give their opinion but they don't have an actual vote now uh i think it was quinn who actually sent them to kieran um and Kieran owns this bar called Cubic Dreams. So they go meet with them. They talk it over. Uh, they're trying to find Adam. And I, I love Kieran. I really do. He's uh, quite a character. And his aspect actually allows him to actually change the material of stuff in the world. Like he can change your clothes. I mean, he can change the tabletop from stone to wood. You know, he has a very weird aspect. And he's a very weird character and i just absolutely love him so and he likes to wear dresses a lot has blue hair you know puts on lipstick very flamboyant character which irritates the hell out of brand and irks rune but kieran is actually a pretty good guy and so they decide to basically team up to go try find adam uh, at that point they make their way to far strike castle to try and go to rescue adam far strike castle used to be a compound for the hourglass throne used to be owned by lord time but the hourglass throne was disbanded for crimes against humanity we don't actually know yet what those crimes are we learn later on in the third book <laughs> what those actual crimes were and why they were disbanded but at this point in time we don't basically far strike castle is abandoned it's basically ruled by drogs the undead ghosts banshees you know, it's a very dangerous place to be. So Kieran and Rune decide to go. Uh, Kieran eventually ends up having to leave because he ends up, I think Kieran is a little bit of a seer. And he was basically sensing stuff and having these outbursts where he's saying stuff that make no sense. Um, I think they're little hints to the future, which I'll talk about later in the video. Um, so Kieran leaves, leaves Rune alone. He goes, he finds Adam, they manage to make it out. After that, they end up going back to the Pack Bell, which is actually owned by Lord Tower. While they're on the way back, they're attacked by Rune. This, that, that, then the Tower actually ends up performing a very powerful piece of magic in order to save Rune and Adam and Bran from Ruick. And at that point, uh, Lord Tower basically tells them, look, we are at DEFCON 5. <laughs> you know, this is all hands on deck. We have a huge problem here. You know, this Ruick is a world ending event. We need to end him. So they end up teaming up together. They decide, uh, they end up discovering that maybe Lord Magician, Lord, the Lord Magician, who basically has something that they need. And so that they de they then they then need to go to the Westlands in order to basically retrieve what they need to basically stop Rook. Um, I know I, I'm I don't want to give away any details or specifics on what happened, you know, because I do want you to read the book to find out the details. But there's a connection with the Lord Magician there, and they need to go to the Westlands in order to stop Rook. You know, and while this is all going on, they're trying to figure out who summoned Ruick. That's the main question throughout the entire novel is 
who is behind all of this. Um, so basically, the tower tells him, look, you know, Adam, Rune, you will go into the Westlands. Your goal is to make it to the Lord Magician's compound. Um, while uh, Brand and everyone else, Max, Queenie, they're all there. They stay behind. Um, and Adam and Rune, they head off. They enter the Westlands. They end up getting attacked by Rurik. And they eventually end up having to seek shelter in Lord Hierophant's Manor in the Westlands. Um, there, they end up sharing an intimate night with each other. Um, and then the next day, they head out. They decide to go to the Moral Certainties Compound, which are owned by the four Arcana. Lady Justice, Lady Temperance, Lord Strength, and Lord Hermit. Um, basically, they've all come together. They translocated this building. And then they basically go there for retreats and all that other kind of stuff. And it's heavily warded, heavily guarded, a bunch of servants, and apparently it's nearby Lord Magician's compound. So they decide, you know, let's head there. That way we can restock up, you know, refill all of our sigils, and then we can head out back again and take Rurik on and do what they need to. <coughs> so they get to the Westland compounds. They find out Kieran's there. Um, <clears throat> Max is there, you know, um, everyone is wet there waiting for them. And it turns out Quinn had a little bit of a hand in getting everyone there. Now, after they arrive at the Moral Certainties compound, shortly thereafter, it comes under siege from Ruick and all of his recarnates and some drogs ends up showing up. And uh, this is a really great scene. It's filled with lots of action. And they go through this whole fight for survival. <clears throat> and Rune ends up using a mass sigil to try to protect them all. A bunch of people are killed, unfortunately. Um, and then in the middle of the battle, Rune ends up performing a magical spell that he shouldn't have used. Well, I mean, he should have used it. And it was important that he used it. But he damaged himself. And after, and you know, and he does this without the use of a sigil. He just reached into himself, himself. He performed this extremely crazy, powerful bit of magic. Um, and it ends up saving them for a short period. And afterwards, he talks about how uh, he feels like he has damaged himself, like he's emptied a vessel he shouldn't have emptied. Um, unfortunately, we don't learn any more about this. At this point in time, we learn more about it in the other books. But it's an incredibly important moment. Um, eventually, he leaves the comp Rune leaves the compound in an effort to save everyone. He ends up taking on Ruik and taking on the bad guy that has started all this, who summoned Ruik into existence. And during that fight, he ends up learning something about the raid on the Sun Court. Um, I'm not going to go in and tell who is responsible again or what the secret is that he learns, but Rune does survive. Brand ends up surviving. You know, of course he does. There's nine books in the series. Main character can't die off in the first book, <laughs> you know. But there are going to be consequences for what happened. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the first book in a nutshell. Um, you know, there is a little bit at the end where they end up having a barbecue. Um, and they end up talking a little bit about the events. Um, and Adam and uh, Rune do end up getting a little closer at the end. Um, there's a little bit of mystery I would like to talk about a little bit later, but yeah, I mean, that is basically the book here. So I know this has been a really long video and lots of detail, and I know I definitely have missed stuff. There's been different stuff I'm just now thinking about that I've missed talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, if you like this video and you think this story is interesting, uh, check out the description below. I'm going to include links to where you can buy the book. Uh, the author does have a website where he has a bunch of free content and free stories that you can actually download and read that involves these characters. Um, for instance, after this book ends, he did a short story called The Sunken Mall, which takes place between the first book and second book. Um, so if you're unsure, go read the free content. It doesn't really deal with the main story. It may give a little bit away, but um, yeah, I give you an idea of what the story is about, how you like it before you go purchase the main book. And I'm going to include all those links down below. So if you really like action, sci-fi, 
fantasy type novels, this is definitely the book for you. You know, those are my kind of book. I love the private investigator type books. I love the mystery. I love the action. I love fighting. This book has it. So if you like all that, I would highly recommend this book. Now, before I continue on, I, I do want to talk about some spoilers and go into some more detail about the book. Um, so if you haven't read it, please stop the video right here. Go purchase the book, go read it, and then you can come back to the rest of this. Um, if you've already read it and preferably read the other books, great. Continue on. We got some spoilers I want to talk about. So let's get into it. <laughs> I got some spoilers I want to talk about some specifics that I'm actually going to read. So the first thing in the book is on page 37. Um, this is at the very beginning of the book where Rune is going to visit the tower and he decides to take Max with him. Um, and there's a scene where they're heading to the Pack Bell and he, Matthias, and they're standing on the sidewalk and basically Matthias is watching everything, you know, and Rune is watching Matthias. And Rune says that Matthias touched his ear twice when the light turned from white to amber on a crosswalk. Went blank when a wear lion teased a crooked finger over his passing thigh. Hit hard on the corner of his lip. He bit, sorry, bit hard on the corner of his lip when the hunchbacked matreon called him grandchild after we stepped aside to let her pass. I, this scene never really made a whole lot of sense to me. First of all, why did he touch his ear twice? I mean, is it just a fidgety type thing that Max did? Or was there something more to it? Was he using some kind of ability? Because we know Max is part fae. So I, I don't know. The touching of the ear seemed very strange. And then you had this hunchbacked matron call them grandchild. Why did she do that? Did did she sent something? Did she know he is the grandchild of Lady Lovers? Or is she just using that as a simple term to describe someone who's younger and smaller than she is? That That is my fir first thing in this book that's never made quite sense. And I've reread this recently. And I specifically marked this location because I wonder if it's going to come in later in the later books. Um, if you have a theory, leave it in the comments below. I would love a theory on that. Now, the next set is actually on page 100 where we're in Saint, New Saints Hospital and Quinn is talking and he has a little prophetic outburst um, where he's talking about different stuff where he says, you know, oh gods, oh gods, what is it? It's like a hole in reality. It wants to touch your face because you are food to it and then everything will start in the middle again and oh, 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 there are storms and they're alive. And there are waves as big as buildings. We're all a school of fish trapped in a bottle. And none of this happens at once. That scene right there where he says all that, I wonder exactly what's talking about now and later. Like he talks about where, you know, it wants to touch your face because you are food to it. Is he talking about Ruick or is he talking about something else later on? That That is a question I want to know. <laughs> And then later on, of course, we talk about the storms and the waves as buildings. You know, we've already encountered that phrase more than once in multiple books. You know, there is going to be some kind of storm later on. In fact, I think the author said in like book five or six or something like that, we're supposed to encounter a storm, you know, that's going to threaten Atlantis. <clears throat> and then the next thing in the book is actually on page 143 where Rune and Kieran are in Far Strike Castle. And of course, Kieran starts having these little visions. And he says, you know, the phrase, you are only my face and voice, not my will. And I will have you remember that. Um, and then also, you know, she fooled us all like Russian dolls inside of Russian dolls inside of Russian dolls, that canny bitch, you know. And then he says, their bodies have been lost to the waves. There is no more cause for hope. You know, he has all these different things that he says. Uh, I just wonder exactly, like, we know the first phrase. You are only my face and voice. If you read the third book, you know what that's referring to. And then that Russian dolls comment, I'm not exactly sure if that's re referring to the third book or not. But then, of course, you have the waves, which, of course, we haven't seen yet. 
And then they have the Westlands that are advancing on us. We must repair. We have not seen that yet. I, I love those little hints towards the future. And that's something I really love about this author is the different little hints that he gives to us, you know, in the different books. Because the first time I read this book, a lot of this stuff didn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, and there's different pieces of information that I didn't pick up on. But every time I read it, there's some new little piece of information, something new that I didn't quite catch or wasn't questioning to begin with. Um, for instance, a question I've had a lot recently, and in fact, I've had it since day one, but with each passing book, this question has become more and more pronounced. And that question is, who is Queenie? Who is she? Um, so the next one, page I want to talk about is page 190 where Queenie is lo alone with Adam in a room at the Pack Bell and I've actually marked this th in this my last read of this book and it says I shut off the TV room sets off shuts off the TV and left the common room and randomly started knocking on doors on the third room I tried Queenie answered more surprisingly Adam was in the room too why was that surprising okay he stood by a bed stacked with half open packaging and shopping bags wearing only boxers with a pair of scissors in his hands okay so first few times i read through this i didn't think much of it you know queenie's just there to help him get dressed help him look at new clothes um because you know at this point in the story adam has been rescued by rune they are in lord tower you know, he needs a new change of clothes. He needs a shower, get some new clothes. She's the housekeeper. She's just helping him clean up. Um, but if you've read later in the books, th there's something going on here. I don't know what, but there is something happening. Who is Queenie and why is she there? Why is she in that room? If, you ha if you've read the other books and you have some theories, leave it in the comments. But this stood out and I wanted to mention that I think there's more going on to that scene than just her being helpful now let's see the next page is actually 353 oh, i'm sorry 343 um this is after rune kills the bad guys and he's basically knocked unconscious from what i can tell and he hears a woman's voice people so white people say white is a peaceful color she tells me the color of silence and rest and emptiness. People lie. Ask anyone who's ever been caught in a killing blizzard or watched the static on a television screen following a nuclear blast or stood in the path of that spell of yours. That exodus was quite the loud bang, what loud blank mess child. And then she goes on to say all around me whiteness. It flows and groans a current of sensation leading into the inevitable distance you'll enjoy oblivion you enjoy you're enjoying oblivion far too much she says i ignore her and let the river pull me stop the woman says and she pins me in place with a force of will wake the woman says she throws me back the way i came who is this woman you know this is not the first time we've encountered this we encounter in other books too but who is this woman. I would love to hear your comments, uh, your thoughts on who this woman is. Like I thought maybe, because they talk about the river as like the afterlife. <clears throat> you know, maybe it's a spirit or guardian from the afterlife is maybe who's talking. You know, another thought is, is this Rune's mother? You know, we know, I think, I think I'm get, may get confused, but I think Rune's mother died during childbirth or died when he was very little. So I wonder if this is Rune's mother speaking to him. Um, another person has said that, and I, I've read some forums about this because this question was asked who this woman is. Someone said they think it might be the Empress. I don't know if that's exactly true. I'm not feeling it's the Empress. Another person said it's actually Queenie, which... I'm not going to dive into that rabbit hole at this point in time in this video, um, but it's a possibility. It could be Queenie, it could be the Empress, it could be Mother's uh, Rune's mother, um, or it could just be someone else entirely. Maybe some creature or guardian spirit in the river who's trying to protect him. 
I don't know. I would love to hear your thoughts on, on that little section and who that woman is that we keep seeing. Now, the last page I do want to draw attention to is 363. This is at the very end of the book at the barbecue. Um, Rune and Adam are standing on the porch. Rune is holding the railing. And basically, they're flirting with each other, especially Adam. Adam tells him, I'm going to start my courtship of you tomorrow. And, of course, this mysterious branch grows out of the railing with blue flowers. What is going on? You know, and they don't even talk about it any more than that, really. But, I mean, it was just that a bit of wild magic. Was that just some kind of magic from Rune or is there more to it? Like, I think the author said there's not really much to that. But I think there is because it's mentioned again later on in another book. So, yeah, those are the different areas that I wanted to talk about specifically. So if you've read the book, I would love to hear your thoughts on those different areas. If there's any other areas you found interesting that I didn't comment on or anything that was wrong, please let me know. Um, I would love to engage with someone about this book. I absolutely love it. So again, I'm going to have some links down below to where you can go get access to all the free stories. Um, there's also a, a website where you can actually buy stuff. I think it's called Rune and Brands Garage Sale or something like that. I'll include that as well where you can buy mementos and stuff like that based off this book. So thanks for joining me for this very long-winded video. Um, and I'm going to do some more videos on the second book and third book and eventually the Edelon too. I'm also going to talk about that one. So thanks for joining me and I will see you next time.